Good morning, everybody. It is Saturday, February 13th, the second Saturday in my birthday month. My birthday is three days away, so I'm a little zhuzhed up today. Um, I'm excited that you guys had joined me this morning. You could have been anywhere else today, but you decided to join me and my guests. And for that, I am very grateful. Um, just to reintroduce myself, if this is your first time watching, my name is Maria Tobert, and I am the creator of the Rose Colored Movement. And you are joining me live today for my Self-Care Saturday segment. Um, the Self-Care Saturday segment is all about joining everyone, all of my viewers on their respective self-care journeys. That looks different for each and every one of us. And I wanted to highlight and, and make it special for each of you. So I bring a whole lot of guests talking about a whole lot of topics so that we can get what we need to be our best self in 2021 and forward and beyond. Um, I hope everybody is doing great today. Um, my guest today is Shauna Cox. And if you were able to join me when Self-Care Saturday was on Instagram, she has been on the Self-Care Saturday platform before. She was actually talking to us about um, maternal health and um, the rates of deaths around infant death and mother deaths um, and pregnancies and underprivileged, underprivileged communities. And so she and I were talking offline and we decided that she had so much other great information and jewels to drop for us. So she's going to come in and talk to us a couple more times. But today um, she's coming to talk to us about weathering and DNA trauma. Also, if you were on that last live, we started talking about it towards the end of the live and everybody was like, wait, I want to know more. So I was like, you got to come back and tell us all about this because it is a big deal. It's something that we don't think about um, because if you're not in the science community, you don't think about um, how the long-term effects of what your family represents with or your stressors that are common with your communities, how that impacts you and your future generations. So Shauna, Shauna's here to talk to us about that, define it for us, and then also tell us how we can be a part of changing that story for our future generations. So Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring her on. Do, do, do. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Even though I just, I slid out the bed real, really shortly before the, the live. I was chilling. I was like, I'm sleeping in today. I'm going to chill. And yeah, so that's why I look rested. You got to take like, care of yourself. You got to yeah. take care of yourself. I'm the same way. I'm like, oh, what am I doing with my hair this weekend? No, oh, well. No, I like it. It's like we look, we look like we go, like we're together. Like we both got curly hair. Um, so anyway, I'm so thankful again for you coming back on to Self Care Saturday. Um, last time, like I said, you were such a um, hit. Everybody was like, give me more, give me more. So I was like, you got to come back. And I'm so thankful that you, um, with all the busyness, because I know you're a very busy person person that you decided to still come and join us on self-care Saturday. So without further ado, I mean, let's introduce first, let's tell the people your background for those who did not get to catch you on Instagram in, um, on when I was on Instagram doing self-care Saturday. Sure, no problem. Um, so my day job, I serve as the associate director for science um, and the division of reproductive health. So, you know, in that position, you're responsible for kind of setting the scientific research agenda around pregnancy. Um, you know, I'm honored to serve in that capacity and bring some diversity um, to that and lens to the science um, that we do. So, yes, you know, right now, um, CDC, you know, love them or hate them um, with everything that's going on with the pandemic. You know, I think there are people there who really and truly do care about health. And, you know, that's where I come from. I really am passionate about, you know, women, uh, mothers, infants, and family health and community health, and really kind of helping, you know, folks understand why certain populations have worse outcomes, and really, you know, trying to spread love and light into those communities, um, you know, in platforms like these and other platforms to really kind of help bring that message to folks that, you know, aren't in the science realm. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, folks are, you know, really immersed in their topic areas. Yeah. And so it's really important to take the time to translate it into everyday um, language, everyday things you can do to really kind of help people grow. 
Yes, and that's what you did. So thank you <laughs> for being one of those persons. Because again, when we try to read, I try to read articles myself to try to be up on what's going on, especially things that directly impact my community. But sometimes the verbiage may be a little over my head. Um, I don't really understand the connections between like me and this study. So it, it pays to have people that actually take the time to break stuff down. Because if we really want to change what our future generations look like or what they manage or have to deal with, with, we got to understand what's going on now so we can take responsibility, accountability, and make change. So into weathering and DNA trauma. Um, we talked about it when we were just speaking about last time, um, just taking care of ourselves and being and being aware of how the things that we are just passing on generation to generation actually is part of the problem in us continuing to be that underserved, underprivileged, um, you know, thinking about COVID that market of people who have those underlying conditions or, you know, preconditions and all of that. We have to understand that we got to stop some of the stuff. And so let's talk about what some of that stuff looks like, Shauna. Yeah, I mean, how I really got in um, interested in this topic um, was from a researcher of University of Illinois, Chicago, um, Arlene Geronimus. And she really did a lot of research that showed like, actually for black women, giving birth in your teens is the safest time to give birth. And I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. You know, and then a lot of the work that I was doing was showing that the gap between black and white women actually gets bigger as you um, get older. So I'm like, what's going on here? Yeah. So really that kind of made me think, you know, it's, what are the other things that we don't measure that really kind of impact our health? And really when, you know, you talk about, especially, and again, I'm passionate about black women, the strong black women, a lot of times what we don't talk about is stress. Mm -hmm. You know, stress can be helpful. Um, you know, when you're a short term situation, you're moving, um, you know, from your house, you're trying to kind of get a, you know, meet a big deadline. So stress, you know, there are times where cortisol can really help you. Mm -hmm. um, there are things when cortisol can, does not help you, and that's long-term stress, right? That's that everyday, you know, rigmarole around, you know, you're going through a divorce or you have long-term financial instability or long-term housing instability. That cortisol actually starts impacting your endocrine system. Um, and a lot of people, again, we don't really kind of verbalize that. And, you know, that's why sometimes you'll realize if you're stressed for a really long time, you might catch a cold. Or if you're stressed for a really long time, I know for me, I have thyroid issues. And that was another time when I started really learning about adrenal glands and burnout, because your adrenal glands is actually what creates the cortisol. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's constantly, constantly, you're under a lot of stress, you can actually burn, it's called adrenal burnout, burn out your adrenal glands, and that could impact your thyroid hormones. So there's a lot of things that stress, long-term stress can actually physically impact your body. And one thing um, that I also started looking a little bit deeper into it, like, okay, so, you know, stress impacts your body. We know stress impacts, you know, things like diabetes, things like high blood pressure things like obesity, all these things that, you know, you're just referring to in regards to COVID. And there's this higher kind of prevalence of these conditions amongst our community. And so, you know, as I, you know, doing my research, reading, trying to kind of get to the bottom of like, what is this thing about stress and how is it impacting our bodies? And, you know, it comes down to, and it's funny because my daughter actually had a project in school. Remember when you learned about DNA in school, we all had to kind of build these little things to kind of say you learned DNA, but people don't realize that stress can actually impact the genes on your DNA. And that's how it impacts things like cancer and other conditions. It can actually, what they call stress, will, the cortisol will create what we call free radicals and the free radicals will attack your DNA and it can cause permanent changes in the structure of your DNA. And again, as we learned in school, right? What happens when you have a baby? That DNA splits in half and it merges with the DNA of the person that you're having a baby with. And so your DNA, we carry the DNA of all our ancestors beyond us. 
So everything that that person has experienced and has messed with the little things on their DNA is being passed on. And so actually researchers have done things like looked at women who have, were in the Dutch famine in 1945. This is not just a black thing. So when you look at women who survived the famine, the Dutch famine in 1945, their babies and their babies and their babies' babies, six generations on, have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of schizophrenia, higher rates of depression. And you see the same thing with p- persons who survived the World Trade Center. There's you know, plenty of evidence. So taking a step back and what we don't talk about is if you have bl- a population of people who have survived enslavement, civil rights, Jim Crow, and those things that were chronic stressors for our ancestors, where they were living in a life life of live and die, constant stress, you know, am I gonna get beat today? Do I need to run away today? Who got lynched today? All those chronic stressors impacts our DNA. And even today, one of the studies that we did showed that black women with a college educated black college educated black women actually have higher rates of poor pregnancy outcomes than white women who haven't gone to high school. And the people at work couldn't understand that. And I was like, well, it's microaggression. How many times have I come in here and y'all made a stupid comment about my hair? How many times have I come in here and you're like, you've said something that made me feel a certain type of way. And we carry this stress on us day after day after day. And it impacts our health and it can impact our children's health and our grandchildren's health. Yeah, that's that's pretty profound, because the first thing I want to point out is a lot of times what I see happen when they're talking about studies, it is the group that they're looking at or proving things through is all, is always different, a lot of times different from me. But your point is taking that same theory, if you scientifically proven that the stressors are going through things, why has there not been as much conversation of understanding how that impact would be on our communities? It's just interesting. Do you, do you find that that is how science typically rolls? Like you being a voice, I have to say, hey, but did you did you look, look at this? Do you, or is it getting better where they're starting to include us in those conversations? We're taking baby steps, you know. I think, you know, I think whether you're in healthcare, whether you're public health, whether you're in education, whether you're a computer scientist, representation matters because you're bringing a different perspective. And it's not just representation. When I always tell folks, you know, when they're trying to create editorial boards and things like that, it's not just kind of having a checkbox and saying, you know, that person, you know, is a minority or is a woman, but does she have a safe space to say? things that need to be said without being demonized. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been, you know, a legacy of, you know, when folks do kind of get these positions, feeling, you know, almost feeling like they have to kind of hide themselves and not speak up because a lot of times it's not safe to speak up. I've seen people, you know, um, one of my mentors, Dr. Kamara Jones, they pushed her out you know what I mean? When she was kind of really trying to bring out a lot of these theories of the gardener's tail and watering and, you know, weathering. And so sometimes it can be hard to be that voice and kind of bring that out. And that could be a stress in and of itself. That's yeah. why you see a lot in the movement now saying it's not my responsibility to educate you about racism. Right. So I think that's, you know, I think it's getting better. You know, I think, you know, even with the work <clears throat> that I have been doing around COVID, you know, trying to help them understand, or even I'll take it back to an example of a conversation. It was real rough around Ebola, right? Mm. So Ebola, you know, um, the co- we had an outbreak in the Congo, um, Dem- Dem- Democratic Republic of Congo, and they couldn't understand why people were burning down the quarantine houses and refusing to listen. And, you know, so they brought in, you know, a group of folks, you know, around health communications. And so I sat and I listened and I said, well, do you know the, do you know who King Leopold is? 
And people didn't know who he was. And I said, you know, he perpetrated one of the biggest holocausts in this world in regards to the Belgians when they were colonizing the Congo. They would cut off your hands. They would cut off your children's hands if you did not meet your quota for whatever plantation you were working on that day. So these people don't not trust you just for no for, for no reason. There yeah. is actually historical reasons why they don't trust the white man. And you need to understand who the community influencers are for you to build your communication campaign to get people to follow the guidelines that you want them to follow. It took a while to get them to understand that. But once they understood that, it wasn't about you and the white <laughs> coat. Oh, excuse me. Oh. It wasn't about you and the white coat, you know, coming in there. It's about you figuring out who the chief and the elder is in the community, c working with them for them to work with your community. Right. And I see the same things with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, whether you believe in vaccines or not, right? there's this thing of, you know, I see it in our in our documents all the time in regards to minorities being suspicious mm -hmm. of vaccines. And I said, well, you need to start that sentence with due to historical trauma, right. minorities are more suspicious of don't act like it's because we are slow or something's <laughs> right. wrong with us. Right? right. Put that phrase at the beginning of the sentence to start acknowledging where a lot of these issues come from. Yes, I, I, I see. I see that everywhere. You're right. The point that you made about that being something that's important. We got a comment that said we need more advocates for issues that impact our community. And that and that is true. We do. We do have them. But like she said, that could be a lot burdensome for them as well if they are still in the minority. So I think that's a whole nother conversation because I want I want to push some of these career choices that are weren't typically ideal or sought out for communities like ours for our kids to be like, oh, I want to be a scientist. Like we need to push more of that. So the STEM things that I see in our communities about trying to get them to understand the importance of being a part of that, I'm all for it. But that that's a bigger conversation. Another thing that I was going to mention that you said was the stress piece and how it displays in um other diseases and stuff, because I'm almost 100% sure that um, my cancer was related to stress. Like when I, I didn't have the genes, I didn't have anything else. So I feel like a lot of that was stress and how I process things. That strong black woman comment that you made, I feel like that is probably a big part of this weathering and conversation and how we are um, kind of groomed to be strong and be able to handle everything as mothers, as career women, as significant others. And over time with all the other things that keep popping up, the plate gets heavier and heavier and we don't do anything to stop and say, well, maybe we need to change that rhetoric and mm -hmm. the, the strength is coming because it's innate, but don't make it feel like if we're not leading that way, that somehow we are less of a woman so let's talk about, let's break down the weathering concept and how some of your thoughts on how we can try to combat that for future generations. Yeah. So you know how you um, see a lot of these health food stores will talk about antioxidants, right? Mm -hmm. So how I talked about, again, bringing it back to the biology and the science, where you have the stress causes the free radicals. And those are the, I guess, kind of the mean things that kind of go around your body and you know, smoking, um, sunlight, um, you know, inflammatory foods, mm -hmm. all those things and stress. Stress is one of the biggest causes of free radicals. And these are things that, again, to attack the DNA um, of your cells. What there also are, you know, because I believe that the universe yin and yang, right? So you got your free radicals, you got your antioxidants. And that's why a lot of times when you kind of hear these commercials and these advertisements for food, that's my antioxidant, antioxidants. Yeah, they're right. Antioxidants are actually good for you, right? So how do you increase the antioxidants um, in your um, body? Um, so it's things like your diet. 
you know, diet, you know, being really, really, um, you know, important in regards to, you know, and I think some of us, we know, you know, you know, those foods that your body doesn't agree with. <laughs> right. You, I know that if I eat some ice cream, you don't want to spend the night with me after I eat some ice cream, right? <laughs> right? So we know what foods kind of, you know, things like dairy, things like red meat, processed foods my kids to this day i i have no just no no problem saying my kids and my kids my oldest two i used to get wick right to this day my kids drink juicy juice because it's a hundred percent juice they can have soda on holidays special events but i don't keep soda in my house because it's you know those chemicals or even if you know again my background is chemistry and I actually used to work in a food lab. There's a reason why Cheetos and Doritos and all that stuff, it's actually designed to be addictive. That yellow powder, and that's why a lot of times people realize when they cut those additives out their kids' diets, it helps with their ADHD symptoms. It helps with a lot of those hyperactivity symptoms. That what you put and what you consume in your body makes a difference. Now, I'm not a vegan or anything um, to that um, it, you know, but I will, you know, give a shout out to people that I know who have juice bars and things like that. Every now and again, I'll just throw a cucumber, um, some celery, some ginger, um, and some pineapples and blend it up and keep that in a fridge in a glass jar and just kind of drink it as my first drink in the morning. So diet, ac uh, antioxidants, you know, getting those fruits, those vegetables, kind of changing the way that, um, We've been, quote unquote, taught that our communities eat when really, truly, traditionally, if you go back, a lot of it was the greens and the dandelions and the pokey salad. All those things. It's funny. My grandmother, every summer, she used to line us up, 16 of us, and we had to take castor oil. And I hated it as a kid. But now we got all y'all paying hundreds of dollars to do a detox and flush it out. Mm -hmm. Like these are things that yes. historically our grandparents and great grandparents did. And we didn't really understand, you mm -hmm. know, some of the actually things that healthy things that they were trying to teach us how to do. Um, another thing I will say, um, exercise. Um, you know, everybody is not a gym rat. I get that. You know, I've stopped wasting my money because I won't go. But what I will do is put on my headphones and just walk mm -hmm. around, you know, my neighborhood. I know a lot of folks don't have neighborhoods that they can walk on. So sometimes, especially this time of year, it's cold. I'll get a jump rope and I'll just go in my backyard and jump of my mm -hmm. jump rope because that's helping your lymphatic system actually kind of clear itself out from jumping up and down from walking. So you don't have to be, you know, a trainer. You don't have to have a flat stomach. It's constantly having that rhythm of moving. You know, there are times where, you know, I'll just walk to the, to the dollar store, you know, um, I miss having a dog. I actually gained a lot of weight after my dog passed away because it forced me to walk every single day. So exercise is another big thing in regards to kind of creating that, those antioxidants. And, you know, depression is a terrible thing. I've had family members that I've lost from mental health illness. But one thing study after study has shown is that exercise is actually the best medication for depression. Okay. It beats any pill out there. So these are kind of the things that, you know, we need to kind of understand, you know, how to make ourselves healthier. Another thing um, is meditation, really learning how to control your breathing, control your mind, control your thoughts. Plenty of studies in regards to the um, the, the, the positive benefits of meditation, tapping, you know, mind control, really kind of having that mind body, um, connection. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, one thing I'll do, you know, I meditate every morning, five minutes before I get out of the bed. Sometimes I do it laying down. Sometimes I do it sitting up, but just spent the time calming my mind. Cause I'll wake up on my brain. Mm -hmm. Stop. Take it down relax. You know what I'm saying? Clear your mind before you even get out the bed and set your mood and your tone for the day before you let somebody else um, set it for you. I like it. And then, you know, finally, I'll say sleep. Um, you know, people have this thing. I'll sleep when you die. You go ahead and do that. Um, I'm asleep while I'm alive and I'm going to enjoy my sleep. 
Um, <laughs> sleep is important. Now, there are times where you're going to lose sleep or something is going on. But one thing that I have learned, especially with my thyroid issues, is if my body tells me to lay down, I'm going to lay down. Mm -hmm. um, and having and creating that space and understanding that it's okay for you to do that. You could be go, 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 and you can create, you know, be creating things and doing things and getting it. But you also have to take time to rest. And if you don't, your body will make you rest mm -hmm. um, one way or the other. It will get what it needs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are just kind of my big four tips in regards to self-care. You know, our mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers gave us, you know, a lot of strength mm -hmm. and a lot of kind of know how in regards to being organized and how to, you know, handle, you know, different things. Um, but now we have an opportunity to continue handling those things, but making the time for self-care in between. That's what they didn't get a chance to do. They didn't get a chance to understand how important it was to have self-care. So you can hold the world up, but know when it's time to put it down and go ahead and take care of you so you can come back and hold it up again. Yeah, that was one of the things that my guest from a couple weeks ago was talking about. Um, Monica Hunter was on here and she was talking about glass balls and understanding that sometimes we think everything is glass balls. We high prioritize everything. And so w the thing is understanding that some of them actually are plastic, but yourself and taking care of yourself needs to be one of the glass one of those glass balls that you keep in the air that you maintain because you can't pour into other people. If you don't have, if you have an empty cup, then what you, what are you pouring? Um, going back to the diet thing, I think um, that was a big, a good point um, as far as like how we have normalized certain things that are detrimental to our health. And you're, and I like how you put it, like, it's not about not having those things or not indulging in things, but I think the real thing is switching so that they are the exception and not like our go-to. It's so many different type of foods that like actually vegan or plant-based, it doesn't mean you have to do it all the time, but maybe mm -hmm. switch out and have like, this is our meatless day or whatever. This is, uh, you put more vegetables in your meals because now it's so much um, help as far as making it taste good and making it, you know, I like, dang, I don't even miss blah, 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 because mm -hmm. it tastes so well. So it's just, opening up your mind again, this whole journey and understanding the impact of weathering and how to change the DNA trauma is going to require you to open up your mind to things that may not be the norm or what you're used to. But again, um, insanity, like they said, is doing the same thing, expecting different results. We can't continue to think that we're going to progress or make changes as far as our future generations if we're not willing to change the way things have been and be open to that. So I think I think that's really cool. I want you to tell me that that little drink recipe that you just gave because I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. What was the ingredients? I'm about to write them down. It was ginger. Yeah, I, know. Again, I, I will take fruit that's about to go bad. Oh. Um, I freeze my strawberries, you know. So the one that I had I made for myself yesterday was a uh, cucumber, pineapple, uh, ginger, and some lime. And I just blend it up. Pineapple will make anything taste great. <laughs> uh, cucumber is very refreshing, very hydrating. It's great for your skin, um, you know, and it has lots of minerals um, in it. Um, a friend of mine, Tara Caparison, I'll make sure I send you her information, has a juice spot. Mm -hmm. in um in Jonesboro where they you know make fresh juices um you know again so these are things that you can kind of do at home you could just a cucumber is 60 cents pineapples three dollars right throw that in a juicer and again keep it in some ginger and throw it in a, um, a glass jar and keep it for three or four days until you finish it um and I don't do it on a regular basis but at least once a week twice a week I try to make myself something to just kind of um, you know, help detox a little bit, you know, celery is another really, really good, uh, vegetable, um, for juices. Um, I'm trying to think what else celery is really good. Um, sea moss, um, you know, I think sea moss is definitely on the scene now, um, mm -hmm. because of COVID. Um, but that's something in Caribbean communities, you know, we've used for years to kind of clear out the phlegm um, in your chest. So, you know, take the time to do the research and understand, you know, it's not about um, 
giving, not turning away from medical care. It's understanding how can you maintain yourself such that you don't need as much medical care if it, you know, comes down to it. And there are folks like, I think it was Patty LaBelle who talked about, yeah, I had diabetes. I wrote a whole new cookbook for soul food mm -hmm. and changed my diabetes and it don't have to be on medication anymore. Um, it takes dedication and it takes discipline, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's very, very possible, you know, to really mm -hmm. um, use food, you know, Dr. Sebi and others, you know, you know, eat to don't eat, live to eat, eat to live, yeah. you know, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a shift in mindset. You know, I still enjoy um, a T-bone every now and again. <laughs> um, I do, but now when I cook stuff, I use, you know, ground Turkey, um, mm -hmm. you know, under, I'll take the time, you know, it's easier to go to Kroger, but I'll take the time to go to the cab farmer's market because they have the chicken that doesn't have the antibiotics in it, you know? So it's, those small changes again because everybody doesn't have a lot of time everybody doesn't have a lot of money and you know one thing i learned when the COVID pandemic i was like i am really feeding my kids because i was go 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 yep. go 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 yeah all the time i was feeding my kids a lot of junk yeah um and so you know now the crock pot the Instapot, you know, these things, you know, the crock pot is my best friend. When mm -hmm. I wake up at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning to do work, I'll throw some chicken breast in there one time. And so lunch is ready by the time, you know, it comes around 1 12, 1 o'clock when they're taking their break from virtual learning. They now have a home cooked meal and they're not eating the stuff that they were eating at school that was really, really processed. Mm -hmm. So it's those small changes or, you know, as you know, one thing when I, I, I used to fast a lot um, with my church for Lent and things like that and give up meat. And like you said, when I started making those dishes, like I curry some chickpeas and um, sweet potatoes or different salads. And I was like, this tastes good. <laughs> and so now I'm like, I don't have to be fasting to decide that I'm just going to have a salad with some potatoes and some grilled broccoli or something on top of it. Right. It's changing that mindset as to what good food tastes like. Um, realizing that, you know, a lot of times, they put a lot of salt and sugar in that processed food and we don't realize it. Right. right? And it changed your taste buds to want that stuff when you mm -hmm. eat it. So learning, you know, about different spices like garlic, that's another thing that is an outstanding antioxidant. When I feel like myself getting sick, I will take some honey and I will crush garlic directly into it and just eat it just like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, really helps. You can look, it, it, it's really an antiseptic and it can really help push viruses out your body. So when I cook, I cook with a lot of garlic, I love garlic. Um, because it's good for you and it gives the food taste without mm -hmm. you having to use a lot of salt. Yep. So, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. You know, one thing about the internet, I always say it could be used for good or evil. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's like having a little computer, a little encyclopedia in your back pocket to mm -hmm. kind of say, you know, what are the things that I can do to, you know, increase the antioxidants in my body and reduce the inflammation in my body? One thing people didn't realize that I realized real early on, COVID actually is not a respiratory disease. It's actually an inflammatory disease. Mm. That's why people with diabetes and all these other conditions were going down rapidly because once what they call cytokines, once those inflammatories got and kept going, it was hard to get that process to stop. Mm. And now that's why they've learned a lot of things. One of the first treatments, if I tell people, if you know somebody with COVID, they actually will give you a steroid, kind of like the same type of steroid they give you when you have asthma and those other things, because it's so important to keep the inflammation down. And so, you know, that's kind of a lesson. Almost every condition, whether it's diabetes, whether it's hypertension, they all cause your body to be in this inflammation, stress, inflammation, all of those free radicals, it's inflammation. So what are the things that can kind of counteract that inflammation? So again, that's the exercise, the good sleep, the good food, the meditation, keeping your body um, in a non-inflamed state is really, really important.
Yeah, and I was going to just suggest to everybody who's watching this, it's like, this is an overhaul of things that have been embedded generation by generation. So when you're thinking about implementing change, pick something and get consistent with that something. I think a lot of times when we try to incorporate change, we try to take everything like, oh, this is all good information. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to stop eating this and do all this pile it up. And it's like, I can't do all this. And you just throw it all away. So just pick like one thing. If you feel like maybe I can incorporate some detox, make some juices to give to my family or change one of our meals a week to something that's more plant-based or meatless, try that. And then try to just take a walk like a 15 minute stroll when you get home and then keep increasing or give yourself the five minute meditation, but don't try to pile it all on because like she's saying, you're talking about years and years and things that we has been embedded in us culturally that will take some time to kind of chip away at and shift our mindset on these things like food. I mean, especially food, because that's one especially of the things that our community, that's a, a way of showing love of coming and showing mm -hmm. community and those not like Thanksgiving and thing. We, it's like a, it's not just the food, it's the food in connection with us gathering and connecting in that way. So it's a whole mindset shift that's going to have to happen. So don't take all of them and then throw them away, throw everything away. Cause you're like, I can't just pick one thing. I challenge everyone who's watching, who hears our voices to pick one thing that you're going to incorporate that she's introduced one thing. And then once you get that down, add another one and then another one Then you'll look up in six months from now, you're like, dang, I'm doing it. Um, so just think about it in bite-sized pieces. I did have a question for you about, um, I wonder whether or not they have understood how any changes, like implementing changes like this, if they have any studies that show how long does it take to actually um, reverse or change back the, the DNA um, impact to yeah. the stress, previous stresses. So I don't know of any studies that have shown kind of this reverse and how it impacts future generations. But there's a lot of studies that show um, when you make some of these changes, how it improves your own health. And mm -hmm. so we're going to hypothesize that it improves future generational health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually, you know, if you stop smoking, um, you will get back to your regular lung function within 30 days. Um, you know, the changes can be really, really quick um, with some of these things, um, you know, switching, you know, your diet, things like that. Usually within 30, within 30 days, you can usually tell the change yourself and other people will notice, um, you know, the change in you. So, you know, it's but it's not a quick fix yeah. right like you were saying anything that you're trying to change a habit like you know the science is like 21 days to change a habit i think people have kind of heard that number so sometimes it takes time to you know implement these things and if you backtrack that's okay you backtrack mm -hmm. you acknowledge it and you keep on moving again right. this isn't about being perfect mm -hmm. this isn't about you know throwing all the things that you enjoy out of your life um <laughs> Anybody who knows me, you know, I believe food is love. And so, you know, I try to cook healthy food, but you're going to get something with a lot of butter, too, you know, um, <laughs> you know. But, you know, for me, it was small changes like I enjoy cocktails. Um, but again, that generational thing, what I realized, you know, even with the pandemic, I'm like, so they closed everything down with the liquor store. Right. So how. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 a it's it's marketing it's training mm -hmm. you're trained from a young age that when you have a stressful day at work you come home and you have a drink yeah so that's how i was dealing with my stress all right have a drink and then i'm like i actually don't feel better right after i drink you know what i mean it's just what i was trained subconsciously because nobody ever told me have a drink when you're stressed mm -hmm. but it was subconscious though that that those things that are years after years that you see people do so now i just try i will still drink socially but i'm a conscious effort not to keep liquor in my house anymore only because i know for me that was something that I was falling back on way too much, right? So it's kind of understanding, like, again, this is not about getting to a place of perfection. This is about a place of kind of doing that self-introspection, that self and what I really like your movement and that self-care movement in regards to what are the things I need to do to care 
um, for myself and make things, you know, um, better for, you know, for me. And again, it could be things like with my Otis, I was the team mom for everything. I had to be the team mom. I had to be the classroom mom. I had to, you know, because I'm organized. I'm very organized. I can make things fit together and happen. And, you know, when I, when I had my other two and I was like, you know what, if that somebody else does it, it may not be the way I would have done it. Right. That's okay. You don't got to do everything, <laughs> right? So it's kind of like those things that you don't even realize that you're doing and kind of turning the dial down a notch. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, something still needs to get done. Shauna will jump in and I will make sure it happens if it's important, it needs to be done. But I've learned to dial it back and know that you don't have to be in charge of everything. You mm -hmm. know, it might be an email at work where somebody has, a, you know, getting ready to start something new. Before I would raise my mouth, I'm like, have fun with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, how do you kind of get to that point where you can still be a strong black woman and you can still be on the top of your game. But like you were saying with your last, um, with your last person, the last speaker, you know, what are the glass and what are the plastic bowls? What are the things that, you know, you need to turn down, you know, and I, you know, I'll junk with my, my cousins and stuff. I think it was like a, like someday this week, the people at work were driving me crazy. And I was like, you know what? I'm taking a bunch of, I'm, I'm off. I, I have an appointment. And I went and I laid down because <laughs> oh. I just needed yes, <laughs> to lay down. down. Mm -hmm. And it was going to, that stuff was still going to be there in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, changing that paradigm of it has to get done right now. There's actually, my sister had shared something to me in regards to how that actually is a white supremacist mentality of making things more of a rush and more important than they are to, you know, as opposed to kind of taking that time of, you know, introspection and you know and, and and just taking your time with things everything isn't urgent so you know it's it's a change in mindset but we're Definitely. getting there you know you have so many sisters you know who are coming on here and really dropping dimes and knowledge in regards to how we can have self-care so it's just mm -hmm. kind of continuing the conversation one weekend at a time thank you Thank you for saying, look, I'm like, look, I need to type that up and put it on a banner because <laughs> I was like, perfect. I want to go to the comments um, really quickly and see what people are saying. I see um, Tiffany said, I just started an anti-inflammatory diet after learning that I have inflammation in my body. I had to go to the doctor to find out that I had to change. It has done wonders for my health. So again, some of the stuff that we are displaying with is because of like, we're doing it to ourselves. It's how we're eating. It's mm -hmm. how we're living. And the thing is, is that I, well, we talked about before normalizing, having these conversations as cooler talk. Like when you're talking to your girlfriends, talking about, well, these are the things that I was dealing with. This is how I'm combating them. Cause maybe I need, I'm like, Oh, I didn't even realize. And then I could go seek out that that kind of help and get what I need. So let's normalize having the conversations about the things we're going through um, and give like just like we give our hair. You know, hey, I got a girl. She's going to hook you up. Um, tell me who your doctor is. Tell me who who your mental health professional is. Help me help myself. Um, yeah. Also, she said, I've come to understand that we need help through coaching counseling to change things that could be embedded as well. And that's true. Mental health is a big part of the mental spirit. health is big. Uh, you know, it's funny because I've been having this debate at work lately, right? Because, you know, one of the things that's kind of coming out now is mental health conditions is one of the biggest causes of maternal mortality, mm -hmm. but that's for white women, right? Because mm -hmm. overdoses and things like that. And what I've been trying to help them understand and trying to see if I can find me some sisters to do some research is that mental health actually shows up differently for black women. Um, it shows up in overeating. It shows up in overcompensating. It shows up in kind of anxiety. Mm -hmm. it, you know, our, even our anxiety and our depression, actually, now there have been studies look different. So the scale that you might use for a white woman to diagnose depression doesn't necessarily work as well for us because it manifests differently 
we have this, you know, um, we still have a legacy of folks thinking like you can pray it away. Prayer mm-hmm. is great. Not saying, mm-hmm. you know, prayer, universe, all that stuff, but understanding when there's times to, um, you know, you might need a medication where you might need to kind of look at exercise, your diet and kind of changing up some of those things, things. And again, it's that whole body um, mentality. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad to hear, you know, the person is eating an anti-inflammatory diet because a lot of times I know for me, because I have thyroid issues, when my thyroid is acting out, it will make me depressed. Mm-hmm. My, your thyroid, your, yeah. the, your endocrine system, your hormones, you know, I think there's been this thing of, you know, women have PMS. No, we have hormones, right? And if your hormones aren't balanced, it's going to cause issues. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've had to learn to be to be graceful with myself and my friends and my family have learned when I'm not answering the phone, it's not because I don't want to talk to you. It's right now I need to be by myself, Mm -hmm. right? And being honest with people and being honest to be able to say that, right? To be able to say, I need this time where I'm not giving, I'm just kind of pouring into myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And so mental health in the Black community, I think a lot of what we see with our Black men is really post-traumatic stress disorder, right? We, you know, talk, we, 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 we talk about Parkland and all these other school shootings and don't talk about what it was like to grow up in East New York and see people getting mm-hmm. shot every day, mm-hmm. right? That That's post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of what you see in our kids and our men and our adults in regards to what they were exposed to and how it impacts us, you know, mental health. There's some parts of this country like East St. Louis that you might as well be living in Iraq. Like mm-hmm. it, there's some serious issues in regards to how we need to change the conversation about some of these things in regards to, you know, violence and exposure and communities and how it really and truly impacts our health and our mental state. Yeah. When we talk about um, mental health and what you said uh, before about how um, like praying used to be a big thing, that's other cultures too that that feel like spiritually or you're being um, punished or it's, it's in a result of something that you've done. So, you know, that you have to have this, you have to own it. And the thing is, is that we make up a lot of things that then hold us into these boxes that we can't get out of. You, The challenge, like we said before, we said something easy in that statement about how you approach food and how you cook, but it's the same way on how you see relationships, how you mm-hmm. see what's acceptable. You know, a lot of things, people being traumatized in families and swept under the rug or, you know, we deal with it. We keep our business to ourselves. And it's like, no, if somebody's doing something they ain't got no business doing, then why are we why are we saving face for them? And then the person who's being impacted is holding on to that trauma and continue to pass that on. Because what I do notice is that you made this point as well. When you don't manage emotions, just like, you know, not managing stress and all of that, it comes out and it displays in some way. So when you think about sometimes we're bitter, we're angry or things like that, it just is because we have nowhere else to put emotions. There's nowhere else to put. We keep trying to manage. I'm strong. I can handle it. Hold my head up high. But in reality, where where is all of that emotion? Where is all that angst going? It's going nowhere. So when you get full and you keep fooling yourself, but then it comes out and now you're the angry black woman or you're, you know what I mean? Bitter or all of these things. And that's why it's important that we start normalizing, managing root cause and not just saying that the strength requires us to handle all of that until it spills out. And then we're being misdiagnosed. We're being mislabeled. We've been stereotyped. And it really is all about starting with how you are letting your kids express themselves like anger, men having anger issues. Well, do they have anywhere else to put emotions? Do we normalize that them expressing emotions? Because if not, they still are emotional because they're human beings. Where is that going? Oh, it's getting stuffed down and then it displays in anger because they have nowhere else to put these. Like we got to start taking some steps back and really realizing that some of the things like our, I love our communities, but listen, Again, yeah, I mean, I think you are saying a whole word, sis, right? So what I always tell people like, okay, I didn't grow up 
um, riding around in a car seat, but I bet you if you had a baby, you'd put that baby in a car seat, right? Yeah. Because when you know better, you do yeah. better. Mm -hmm. And so how do we kind of take the time back to, again, I always look at it as your strengths and your traumas, right? There are a lot of traumas that are passed down intergenerationally, but I don't want to forget those no. strengths, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, I always, you know, try to tell my kids every or any child, child or even ourselves as adults, every person that you see of color um, that has, you know, generationally, um, you know, shout out to my African born brothers and sisters, but Caribbean, um, you know, American diaspora. Now, there are some black people who were here before, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, right? I don't talk about that Survived in the belly of a ship for two months. Right. You got some strong DNA in your body because mm -hmm. there's some way in your bloodline that survived that. Don't ever forget that, right? We probably are the strongest people genetically because of that. Mm -hmm. But because of the traumas, there's also some things going on too. So kind of how do you balance the strengths that our community has around community and being there for each other, but then also understand what is passed on in our communities that's around trauma. You know, a big topic that people, you know, I stop commenting on Facebook is around in their kids, right? <laughs> and this is coming from somebody, my oldest, he used to catch it. But as I learned and I grew and I got better, I realized like, wait a minute, I can actually raise respectful, disciplined children and not have to whoop them. You know what I'm saying? So like, and you know, you got folks who, because that's how they were raised and because I'm not saying they right, not saying they wrong, they hold on to that. And they're not able to take a step back and say, okay, I was raised this day. I may think I'm okay, but whatever, right? I'm okay, <laughs> right? And then, but take a step back and think about things from different people's perspectives and being able, they call it cognitive dissonance. You'd be amazed once you kind of grow up with a thought process, it's really hard to change. It's very hard to change that thought yeah. process because you got that from people that you looked up to and yeah. loved. You know what I mean? Like that's what and you to were taught. That would be to so being them. able to change that, mm -hmm. it's that's hard mm -hmm. work. But that's something, like you said, our community, those are the things. Like how do we enhance our strengths but understand what some of our th things that we do in our community that really come from a place of trauma and kind of shift those conversations. Yep, shift in one, and it starts with us. So like we said, the challenge is on you to pick one thing that you're going to challenge in your life that you know is might be questionable. I mean, it's funny, this is just a funny story, not really funny, but ironic, that's the, ironic. Um, I was spanking my child for hitting someone and I was like, you don't hit people. And I'm like, uh, that felt a little weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but that's what, you know, we are, are taught, like you said, to do certain things. So if it, if it's making a question mark in your head, don't be like, well, that's the way, because I've had people literally say this, but that's the way that my mom taught me and I'm good. Like, I understand that respect that respect that you made it, that she, um, I had another guest before was talking about those relationships. They can only do the best that they can in that moment with what they have. What but they now have. that you, like you said, if you know better now, do better so that you can change and kind of fix some of the things like take the good stuff, take, you know, take it, acknowledge them for trying their best, but then say, well, my best looks like this. That's all we're saying. It's your best may it look different. It look different. So it's let's, different. Yeah. let's be okay with that. So anyway, this time is, it's dwindling down. I'm like, I could be on here forever as always with our conversations. You have so, you drop so many good jewels and I just enjoy um, having these conversations with you. So I'm looking forward to our next one. Um, but before we get out of here, I wanted to see if you wanted to drop a couple little, what is something you want to sum up or a couple of jewels you want to people to make sure that they take away from our conversation today? Self-care. Um, you know, again, really wanting to help people learn um, that it is these, that this is kind of scientifically proven, um, you know, and a lot of the health issues certain communities deal with, you know, are, can be impacted by intergenerational trauma that affects our mind and our bodies. Um, but we have the opportunity to raise awareness around that and change the focus and change the conversation to acknowledge those things 
and identify again, what are those things of self-care physically and mentally that will make you a healthier person, uh, mind, body, soul. And when you're a healthier person, you can pour out to the people in your life, your friends, your family, your children, your community um, from a better place. So, you know, it's all about self-care. Um, none of these things have to be permanent. It's not a life sentence. It's not a death sentence. Right. Um, you have the power to um, take care. And like you said, just one thing, one at a time, you know, one day at a time, um, just one thing. And, you know, on your um, journey um, to improving self-care and having better health. You heard it here first, folks. So I'm all of y'all. Y'all better be doing one thing, one thing. <laughs> Figure it out and let's make it happen. And we and so that we can be the change that we want to see in our in our communities and in our worlds. Um, as always, you can meet me here on Saturdays at 11 o'clock for another self-care Saturday chat. Um, I will continue to try to find content that can help us improve and, and live our improve our lives and live our best lives. Um, thank you to all the guests that engaged with us. Uh, I mean, all the guests, all the viewers that engaged with us today. Um, like I said, this is a great conversation and I'm walking away. Already I'm going to speak life over husband. you, girl. One of these days, you're going to, once this thing, you're going to have you a session in person and you're going to have some live guests. I feel it. I feel it. And I claim that's really what my dreams are. And I'm just going to keep pushing towards it until it becomes a re reality. So thank you guys for hanging in there with me. Again, thank you, Shauna. Till next time, you guys have a great Saturday and always be kind to yourself and then definitely be kind to others. See you next Saturday. Bye, y'all. Bye.